Talk and Rock Radio, where friends meet at the intersection of life, inspiration, and music. Here's your host, Rick Kern. Welcome, everyone, to Talk and Rock Radio. My guest today is an American songwriter, session guitarist, recording artist, producer, and author. Welcome, John Beeland. Hey, Rick, how you doing? Well, yeah. good to have you with us, man. You know, I thought what we'd do today is talk a, a little bit about your your history, man. You've you've got such a colorful history of of working with a lot of great people, and you've done some good things yourself as far as your own compositions, which we're gonna share with everybody today. But I thought what we'd first do is uh, talk a little bit about you know your your beginning of working with Linda Ronstadt in the late '60s. You know, you you all were part of a group called that you formed called uh, Swamp Water. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, sure. Well, I, uh, I got with Linda, um, believe it or not, I, I, uh, I first met Linda uh, when we were fixed up on a blind date. Um, I, I was going, uh, I was in a group called One Man's Family, um, which was an offshoot of uh, the group Spanky and our gang. Uh-huh. Um, Sp- Spanky had quit and, and another girl, Sue, uh, uh, Richmond took over, but anyway, the um, the guys were all. You know, I was about. I think I must have been 18 years old when I uh, when I got the audition for the group. The 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 original guitar player in Spanky had died, and uh, Lefty Baker. So anyway, I joined this group, and it just so happened that they rehearsed a lot in Topanga Canyon, and um, the guitar player in the group, uh, one of the founding members, uh, Nigel Pickering, happened to be dating. Um, this beautiful girl, Brooke, uh, who lived down the road from where we rehearsed in this old barn. And uh, one day he fixed me up on a blind date with Brooke, with Brooke's uh, roommate. And uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go because I, you know, blind dates, I, you know, I, I just smelled disaster, you know, <laughs> and uh, I asked him who it was, you know, and he wouldn't tell me when we got to the, we got to the door of the house and, uh, uh, and then right at the door before we knocked on the door, he told me it was Linda and I, you know, I almost had a coronary, you know, because uh, <laughs> because Linda was a pretty uh, she was uh, the hot one of the troubadour at the time. And uh, yeah. she was pretty popular. Anyway, we went to uh, I, I we went inside them and uh, Linda came out. And as soon as she came out of the back room, uh, we hit it off like we'd known each other for a long time. It was great. And uh, we we went to a party at uh, Tad Dilt's house. Henry Dilt's the famous photographer. And uh, we sat around in a circle and uh, played music, just like uh, like those corny hippie movies you see on TV. And we were passing the guitar around, and uh, Linda was um, right uh, next to me, and she got to hear me play. And uh, she asked me later that night if I would play guitar for her uh, because she was uh, going solo, and uh, she was forming. She wanted to form uh, her first backing band. Um, and, um, her first serious backing band, cause she's, she had a couple of musicians back her up prior to that. But, um, anyway, I couldn't do it because, uh, we were, we were booked on tour with one man's family. Uh, we had concerts with the Hollies and the birds and everything all lined up all the way to Chicago. But I told her if, if it didn't work out, you know, uh, I'd love to do it. If the, you know, for some reason she said, well, okay, well, you know, if the band ever splits up, give me a call. So we went to Chicago with one man's family, and we had just finished doing a concert with the Birds. And um, let me see, it was the Birds, the Second City cast, uh, which was incredible, and uh, and Al Cooper and us at the Aragon Ballroom. And uh, all the record companies were out there, and uh, we did fantastic. And um, the next day, we thought, wow, you know, we're gonna we're gonna on our way to landing a major deal. And it was a great band, you know. I mean, we great five part harmonies and just terrific well anyway nigel who fixed me up on that blind date originally met a cocktail waitress in chicago while we were there decided he was going to leave the band and left everybody hanging and uh so i picked up the phone real quick and i called linda and she said well come on back to la and uh you got a gig and so i did we uh, uh we drove back to hollywood and um, i got together with linda and she had told me that she had she had three musicians from Palmdale, California, uh, already picked out, you know, and uh, 
they were kind of a self-contained country band from from up around that area. They were, and also the the lead singer was a real good friend of the Birds, uh, Clarence White. And uh, so she said they're a little weird, you know, but um, but they're really a, you know, great musicians. And and so we rehearsed, and at the end it was Gib Gilbo and and Eric White, the brother of. Um, Clarence and uh, Stan Pratt, and uh, we had this, we kind of had this neat little sound uh, when we uh, were rehearsing away from Linda, and uh, it kind of morphed into this, uh, uh, the Swamp Order thing. Uh, Eric left the band, and so we got the uh, guy named Thad Maxwell came and joined the group to play bass. So we were, um, um, we were, uh, it, we would do the live shows with Linda. I mean, it would be, uh, we would kill them, you know, because we had this Cajun rock kind of sound, kind of a tr- uh, cross between uh, uh, the birds and uh, and Creedence Clearwater. And the, and people would go crazy because Gib would play the fiddle and we'd have these great harmonies. And uh, um, Gib had this, so- Gib had a solo deal with Starday King and he was getting ready to fly down to Mexico to do the album with, with John Wagner producing and at the very last minute, he he talked to me about maybe if, instead of him doing a solo album, if we would be interested in putting a group together. And he had this name Swamp Water, and I said, uh, yeah, you know that'd be really cool, uh, uh, because my background was really in harmonies and guitars, and Gibbs was uh, with was songwriting and Cajun fiddle and singing. It was a really great combination. So uh, we uh, we went to um, Linda's manager and told him what we wanted to do, and uh, he was all for it. So before we knew it, we were on a plane to the Albuquerque, New Mexico, of all places, to record uh, this album in between tours with Linda, and uh, we did the album in four days, and uh, it was we we ended up having a chart record uh, called Take a City Bride off of it, and it was just it was a fantastic group, and and. Uh, very, I think, very much ahead of their time because it was kind of like the Eagles meets Creedence Clearwater, you know. And um, we did uh, two albums for one for Starday King, and then the second album was for uh, RCA. And and that and that album we recorded uh, part of it in Hollywood and then part of it in Nashville. And the Nashville sessions we used. Um, uh, some really great uh, side guys to join us uh, on the album, um, like we did in Hollywood. We we had Glenn D. Harden from from the Crickets playing piano, and uh, um, and uh, Sneaky Pete from the Flying Burrito Brothers. He came in and played on our album, and uh, and yeah, it was, it was a great time. You know, we it was a great it was great touring with Linda and uh, Swamp Water back there, and uh, um, it was a great show. You know, I mean, Linda was just amazing every night and then swamp order had a little bit part in the show in the middle of the show we would do a couple cage of rock uh, tunes and everybody loved it you know it was uh, really uh, really a neat uh, a neat band uh, unfortunately um swamp water had the same problem that poco had and uh, and that was uh, we were country and rock which meant neither neither format would play our records you know Right. And and so although the crowds went ecstatic over it, uh, radio didn't want anything to do with it, you know, because uh, you know it had steel guitar or it was a fiddle and and uh, it was the same problem Poco had really. I mean, you know, there were our popularity really came from college radio, and uh, so you know we after two albums I uh, uh, I decided to go off on my own and uh, um, and. That that was in 1971, and uh, so we lasted from from 69 to 71. You know. Well, let me ask you: uh, the song "Mayor Take Me Home." I know you yeah. all you all played that song with Swamp Water, uh, but yet you you didn't record it until the version that you sent me, which was a few months ago when you when you did the recording. Did you use some of the players from Swamp Water when you did that, or did you use some session players there in Nashville? Or no, um, um, the the. Uh, the the version that I sent you uh, is just me. It's it, and and also my uh, my friend Thad Maxwell from Swamp Water. He came up to the house and we recorded it together uh, up here, just the two of us. And um, it was written by Ian Matthews from Matthews Southern Comfort, which was a band kind of like Swamp Water. They were from England and um, and they were a great band. Uh, Ian is—he's still out there rocking. He's a great singer, songwriter. 
And he had this neat tune that they recorded called Mare Take Me Home. And we thought it sounded like a Swamp Water song. So we were getting ready to record it. And I don't know what happened while well, we never did. So anyway, my friend Thad was out here at the house one day. And I said, you know, why don't we record that damn song? You know, uh, after, after 50 years, you know. One, two, three. Use the earth as a pillow and the sky as a blanket of blue. Now all that I own is a shirt on my back and a blanket and a saddle on you. So there, take me home. There, take me home. There, take me home. I spent some time in jail Then my face turned pale and my health was starting to fail So the sheriff, he let me go But then the townspeople caught me and they ran me out of town on the rail So mayor, take me home Mayor, take <laughs> so uh, that's the that's the version that I sent you. Um, it's uh, Thad and I uh, here at my house, yeah. uh, there, out, out in the ranch. Well done, man. It sounds really nice. The uh, another song that I really liked uh, isn't it amazing? The one that you uh, you wrote oh, yeah. for Mark Farner from from Grand Funk Railroad. Uh, it became number two in the uh, Contemporary Christian. Uh, hits of, of 1989, right? Yeah, you know, it, it was a real shocker for me because uh, originally I wrote it for, of all people, I wrote it for Joe Cocker because he had had that record, um, uh, um, the McCartney tune, um, I can't remember the song now, but anyway, I, I thought, well, this would be a great one. So I demoed it at uh, Leon Russell's house and because uh, I was signed to his publishing company. So uh, for the for the vocal, I had uh, Larry Stewart from Restless Heart sing the vocal, and uh, it was a great demo. And it just so happens that my my friend from back in hometown Illinois, that who who uh, together we taught each other how to play guitar, he was at my house one day, and he and he he was living in Michigan, and he said, you know, I got a friend of mine. His name was Mark Farner, and I had never heard of Mark or, or listened to Grand Funk records, uh, you know, but. Uh, he wanted to give Mark, he said Mark is a, a kind of a, a born-again Christian now, and he was doing this uh, Christian, and uh, kind of Christian rock album. And uh, he liked. He wanted to give Mark the song to, to take a listen to. Well, to make a long story short, uh, Mark got the song, and he called me up, and he said, man, I, you know, I really love the tune, and I'm going to record it. And... Rain, rain, won't you please go away Save all your gray skies for another day I've had my share of all your trials and tears Now i found someone new who'll make them all disappear Suddenly they've all disappeared Isn't it amazing what a prayer can do When it all seems hopeless It'll pull you through and Isn't it amazing how a broken heart grows strong And every now and then that Special someone comes along. And uh, and about uh, about about ten months later, he uh, he actually did record it, and it became a, a huge uh, a hit in the Christian 
market because uh, although I wrote the tune basically about my daughter being born, he interpreted it to be about God and, and Christ. And um, so uh, it, it became huge. And we started, I got all of these letters came in from people, testimonials from people who, uh, um, the, the, who were uh, struck by the song. And, uh, and it was really an overwhelming experience for me as a writer to, uh, to get these letters. And, uh, um, it, it, and Mark sang it, sang it beautifully. Uh, he did a great job on it, and it was nominated for a Dove Award. And uh, and for me, I, I'd never written anything like that for that genre, you know. But um, uh, to this day, it's still played in churches uh, around the world, and and uh, and people still come up to me and tell me, uh, you know, you know what they how they felt about the tune. And uh, it's quite a change so, from some kind of wonderful, you know, to that. You know, <laughs> it sure was. Well, you know, Mark. Mark is a he's a preacher, and uh, he uh, he's a he's a he's an intense intense kind of a guy, but very nice. And 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 uh, one after it became a hit, uh, I was living in Napa, California, and uh, Mark came through town to do a concert. You know, so he invited myself and my my wife and kids to the to the show, and I went, "Oh, this is great! I'll be able to hear him do. Isn't it amazing?" And we were his guests and we were watching the whole show and he sang all the grand funk tunes and then his new songs and he was fabulous, but he didn't sing. Isn't it amazing? And I kind of, you know, I was a little bummed out and, and, uh, and then uh, he came out for the encore and the, and the lights all went down and everybody started lighting, lighting like candles and stuff. And, and he sang, isn't it amazing? And it was just, in the crowd he stood up and, I mean, it was really an incredible experience to to witness that. And uh, at the end, it was really neat because at the end of the night when the show was over, the photographers were taking our picture and uh, backstage of Mark and I. And uh, and I told Mark while our pictures were getting taken, I told Mark, I said, you know, um, I'm really grateful for you re- to reporting that too, Mark. And uh, it's really been uh, overwhelming. In effect. And but I said, I have to be honest with you. I, I never really wrote that song about God, you know. I wrote that song about my daughter being born. It, it really wasn't about God. And he leaned over to me and he said, "How do you know?" <laughs> and I and, and when he said that, I thought about it, and my wow. whole face my whole face crinkled up, you know, in a confused look, you know. Right. And and it was at that very time that the photographers took the picture of Mark and I. And so the next day, when it came out in the paper, there was Mark who looks fabulous. And and then there was me next to him with my face all crinkled up, wondering. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so anyway, uh, yeah, I've, I've, it's it, it's been a it was a great experience having Mark uh, record that tune. Oh man, that's that's a great story. The, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna throw a lot of names at you here right now, and I'm gonna let sure. you let you uh, go from there. But uh, these are. <clears throat> uh, obviously people that you've worked with and everything through the years and, and whatnot, but I'm going to go ahead and, and just name a bunch of names uh, okay. for the listening audience. Dolly Parton, the Beatles, Garth Brooks, Johnny Cash, yeah. Ricky Nelson, Alison Krauss, Arlo Guthrie, Buck Owens, Linda Ronstadt, we've already talked about, Merle Haggard, Waylon Jennings, Chris Christopherson, and Elvis Presley. Out of all those names, which one, if you had to pick one, would be a standout moment of, of experiences that you had with them either on the road or as a session player, uh, you know? Yeah. Well, that would be, that would be Ricky Nelson. Cool. Okay. And, uh, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Chicago, uh, watching Rick and his uh, family on TV every week and, and really waiting for the end of it where Rick would sing a song, you know, and I was such a fan of James Burton, his guitar player, you know, and uh, he and that was a big deal at my house, you know, the Ozzy and Harriet show. Sure. And and so Rick, you know, I became a huge fan of Rick's. I had all of his records. I I, I did autopsies on him, you know, and uh, <laughs> and as luck would have it, when I was seventeen, my dad announced that we were moving to California, you know, and. Uh, and so uh, for me, it was great because a few months after being there, I, went, I, I kind of ran away to Hollywood. And um, 10 years later, uh, I guess you know, 12 years later, I got the call to play guitar for Ricky. And uh, and he and I had a terrific relationship, you know, uh, in, in a way, I knew some of his records better than he did, you know. And uh, 
uh, and that really helped uh, putting together his uh, new show that we took to Vegas and uh, where we started, where we did a lot of the hits that he had done in a long time, you know. Right. And uh, he was a great guy, and uh, um, uh, recording with him in Memphis was a treat, and recording in Hollywood, you know, it was just the be- the best. He, w- he was like the TV show. He was such a nice guy and uh, and a really a talented guy. Um, as fate would have it, uh, in 1985, uh, um, he, uh, he had called me from the road and, uh, wanted to know if I'd be interested in coming back to work with him. And, uh, and he, and the answer was yes. I, I was really anxious to leave Nashville and go back to California. And, uh, so my wife and I found a house and, uh, in Claremont, California and started packing. And, uh, unfortunately, um, the airplane. I was supposed to. I was supposed to join him right after the Christmas holidays, and unfortunately, that's when his plane crashed and everybody died. You know, and uh, I ended up staying in Nashville. You know, but he was a great guy. I got to do Saturday Night Live with him with the original cast, and uh, um, it was just an amazing period. You know, and uh, there's nothing better than working with uh, somebody who was an idol of yours when you were younger, you know. Well, and you wrote a, a hit song for him, didn't you? Well, I arranged one for him. I, I had an arrangement of uh, Bobby Dern's uh, hit record, uh, Dream Lover. Oh, okay. And, uh, and, but I, I had a, this kind of radically different arrangement of it, a, a kind of a James Taylor kind of arrangement. And uh, originally, it, it was I, I had arranged it for a country singer in Australia, and uh, but I played it for Rick while we were recording one t- one one night, and uh, he loved it. So we worked we worked it up and recorded it, and, and uh, it was really his last uh, hit record. And we did it on uh, oh, a ton of TV shows, and as well as Saturday Night Live. You know, I know when we were on the road with my band, uh, he had come to El Paso and played uh, a place here called the Free Holy. Were you part of that gig? Did you go? Well, you know, do you know what year? It, it you know, was? it would have been in the seventies, but I can't tell you. It would have been seventy. I was on the road from seventy three to seventy eight. So, well, if it, it was if it was seventy eight through eighty, uh, that would have been me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, and if it was prior to me, it would have been Dennis uh, uh, Larden, I, I think. But uh, yeah. It could have been very well. Could have been. Yeah, know. interesting. Did, did did you did you buy me a beer or anything? I, I was on the road, so no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I missed the gig. That's why I was asking you if you if you played that night. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we I may have. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Allison Krauss, one of my favorites. Oh yeah, she's sweet. I I love her. She's uh, uh, not only is she you know brilliant as a singer, but uh. She's a very funny girl too. She's got a great sense of humor. I uh, I was doing a song with the uh, with the Flying Burrito Brothers for an album called California Jukebox and um, no uh, Sons of the Golden West. And uh, I, I I had uh, ironically I had arranged an old Ricky Nelson tune for us to do, you know, and uh, for me to for me to sing. And I want I was going to do a duet with Dolly, and uh, at the last minute Dolly had to cancel, so I didn't know who to get and then i thought about it and i said well let me let me call you know allison and see if she'd be interested and she was and she came down to the studio and uh her and i did a duet we did uh there'll never be anyone else but you and um and she was so much fun to work with and she was absolutely brilliant as a singer um it was uh, jaw-dropping to watch her uh um watch her at work you know but uh i, I had a ball with her i, I we laughed and laughed, and uh, she had a great sense of humor, and uh, um, and I love her. She's one of the one of the greats. Oh, she still is, just really mm-hmm. doing a great job. Arlo Guthrie, how did you uh, connect with him? How'd that happen? Well, I did it with Swampwater and Linda. Happened to do a tour uh, in 1970 with uh, with Arlo, and uh, um, we opened for Arlo. And at the end of the Arlo show, we, both bands would get together and jam on stage and people in the crowd loved it. And, uh, during, during that time, Arlo asked me if I'd be interested in, uh, being in this band they were putting together for the Hollywood bowl. It was a tribute to Woody Guthrie and the band would be made up of kind of like these really great players backing up 
Odetta, Richie Havens, uh, Joan Baez, uh, uh, the country Joe McDonald, um, who else? Pete Seeger, uh, Rambler Jack Elliott. And I was picked to be the guitar player, and uh, Ry Cooter and I uh, oh, did neat. the guitars. Yeah, and it was at the Hollywood Bowl. And, and that album, by the way, is uh, it's on Bear Family Records, I believe. Uh, it's out. You can actually you can hear the and see. I think the, the video is available too. Uh, the recording of that uh, concert. It's it's in the Library of Congress that uh, um, the uh, the album, the live album. And anyway, we so you know we Arlo and I really hit it off naturally. And uh, um, and after that, he uh, he. He wanted. He asked Swamp Water if we wanted to back him up, and so we left Linda, and um, we went with Arlo Guthrie. I think Arlo offered us five dollars more than Linda, so we jumped on. <laughs> <at> it. <laughs> yeah, All like right, baseball. Think of like a baseball team, you know. Uh, even back then, man, money talked, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, back then, yes. Yeah, since we were making about, I think we only made about. 150 bucks or 200 with Linda yeah. a, a week and Arlo probably Arlo probably paid us uh, 160 bucks. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. But I got to do I got to do Carnegie Hall with Arlo and uh, we did some great jobs together and he's still a friend to this day. I talk to him quite often. He's retired now, but uh, Is he uh, is he out in LA still or where's he at? No, no, he, Ar- Arlo is out on the East Coast uh, um, and uh, I can't remember the name of the place, exact place he's at. He's got a farm Huh. And uh, and he uh, yeah he announced his retirement this year, so excellent. Um, Buck Owens, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah, Buck. And uh, and and I was going to ask you, um, being a picker yourself, uh, do you do you know Richard Smith? There no, I don't. Nashville, no. check him out. He's a he's a one or two time national flat picking champion. Uh, he still lives. He's he's from London, but he lives in in Nashville. In fact, he'll be doing an episode with me next month. He's down in Go Florida there. doing some shows right now. Um, but he's going to be back. He called the other day, and we're going to uh, do an episode next week. You'll like this guy. He's incredible. Oh, but cool. that's why I mentioned buck owens uh because he goes he goes way back when this when he was 11 years old uh he was he was on national tv with uh i'm not sure i think it might have been buck owens i'm trying to remember if it was that i know he's done a lot of things with tommy emmanuel he's on yeah all over the place uh with tommy emmanuel but check him out but buck owens how did you how did you hook up with him well, uh, I first met Buck back in um, uh, 80, 82, I think, when uh, Gib and I, as the Burrito Brothers, we were now a duo. We did uh, the, the Hee Haw, and, uh, and, uh, and our song was kind of Buck Owens. We had kind of like a twangy Telecaster sound. And um, anyway, uh, the, uh, Buck introduced us on the, on the TV show. Well, years later, we were doing uh, a Flying Burrito Brothers session, and I, w- I wanted to, to do the instrumental Buckaroo uh, that he had made, you know, years and years earlier. And so uh, I thought, well, it would be really cool if we can get Buck to play rhythm guitar on it, you know. It'd be, and I, I saw I called him. He's in Bakersfield. And he said, yeah, come on over. He said, come on down. He had a studio in Bakersfield that he had had for uh, years. And uh, so I flew out there, and... Uh, and Buck and I did, um, uh, we did Buckaroo together, and he was so funny because uh, he, 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 for one thing, he's really a funny guy. Yeah, and, uh, he, and he came, he, he came in and into the control room, and and, and uh, we were just we can tell him stories left and right. And uh, when it came time for him to put his part on, he, he went out to the middle of the studio. It was a big studio, and uh, he was he kept blowing it. You know, he kept uh, making mistakes and and. Uh, um, and then he got to this one point where uh, he had just made the mistake so many times that he he said that he the big f bomb. Oh no! You know, he, <laughs> and he said it like five times in a row, real fast and loud. And uh, and that, and then the last time he said it, there was a silence. And he looked at he turned into the microphone and he said to me in the booth, he said, "Did you catch all those f's, John?" <laughs> <laughs> but he was a sweetheart of a guy and and not only did he do that for us but uh later that evening he uh, uh he asked give and i if we would uh go down to his new country club called the country uh, the golden uh, country palace i think it was called 
and uh, if we would play, and uh, we, you know, we hadn't played in a long time together, and but uh, he had the Buckaroos back us up, and uh, he had a limo pick us up and take us to the club, and we went on stage, and that was the last that was the last time Gib and I played together, um, oh, wow. and uh, very very uh, very memorable night. Merle Haggard. Merle was, um, uh, I had met Merle a couple times over the years, just briefly, but uh, again, for the Flying Burrito Brothers, we were recording Mama's Hungry Eyes, and uh, again, I wanted to have maybe Merle do a, a verse or two along with us, you know, it was a long shot, but um, uh, through his manager, um, uh, Bill Bradley, um, or um, his engineer in Nashville, Bradley, uh, I got a message to Merle and he said, sure, you know, come on out to the house. And, uh, at the time I lived, uh, in, and in, in Napa and Merle lived in Reading and it was only a few hours drive to his house. So I went up there and, uh, um, and Merle, you know, he was a hero to me, you know, and, uh, when I got to the house, uh, uh, he was the most charming, uh, energetic, guy when it came to music it's all he wanted to talk about like buck was the same way they loved talking music they didn't want to talk about their golf game or anything like that it was all about music and they would light up like kids you know and merle uh, merle and i chatted forever and it was really neat when i went into his studio he had pictures along the wall life size of uh of him in his younger days at Capitol records recording you know mm -hmm. and then when you got to the studio there was a sign right by the by the uh the control room door that said absolutely no cigarettes or drugs or alcohol, you know, which, you know, was pretty strange considering Merle's reputation, you know? Right. And, uh, and then when I went into the control room, the first thing I noticed was all along the, the ceiling, all along the, the length of the control room, he had a little toy train and it kept, and it, it, it would just chug along all the time we were recording, you know? <laughs> Up, up above us. <laughs> so there's there's where some of the train songs came from, then, right? Hey, hey, well, he yeah, he loved trains. Oh yeah. He told me he he, to, he told me we were talking about you know the new country at the time, which I wasn't a big fan of, and it turns out that he certainly wasn't. And he said, you know, you know, John, he says the thing is that uh, they keep doing these tributes to me, uh, like on TNN with these these new singers and new groups, and he says. Uh, and I'm not a fan of that crap. And he says, you know, he says, and he looked at me, he says, I wish they wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, he was, God. he was fabulous. He had, he had, uh, uh, you know, he had that voice. And um, as a producer, since I was producing it, I, I had to put my producer hat on and be able to tell him, you know, when I thought maybe he strayed a little bit pitch wise or whatever. And, uh, and he appreciated all of that. You know, he didn't want anybody pandering to him and, uh, and that's one thing I could do from working with all of the stars I work with. I, and, uh, I could, I was always a straight shooter, uh, as far as my, uh, my opinion. Yeah, and, um, yeah. I didn't have to pander to anybody, but he, Merle, Merle was great. He couldn't have been nicer. And, uh, um, and he did, he did great on the, on the recording. Christofferson, did you, uh, yeah. did you play with him or was that sessions or what, what was that? One? No, I, I was, I was Chris's first guitar player when he came to Hollywood. He was uh, playing Hooten. Um, he he was going to play a Monday night Hootenanny night, the open mic night at the Troubadour, uh -huh. and he and uh, my friend Larry Murray uh, from the Hearts and Flowers was uh, the MC, and uh, Larry t told me he said, "Hey, listen, uh, I got this friend from Nashville that's singing tonight, and he, and he could use another guitar player. You know, would you would you work with him? He's really a great songwriter." And I said, "Yeah, sure." You know, I was eighteen, and uh, so Larry took me up the stairwell of the troubadour into the um, the opening act's dressing room, which was like a closet. And uh, inside was this guy with uh, um, old suede pants on, a black T-shirt. He had uh, beat up beat up suede cowboy boots and an old Martin guitar. His hair was slicked back, and he had an old Martin guitar with uh, signatures carved into the body. You know, and I kept thinking, like, what the hell? And and uh, he introduced me, said, Chris, this is John Bielan, John's Chris Christopherson. I said, nice to meet you. And uh, he said, well, I really appreciate you backing me up. Um, um, he said, I, I know Chet Atkins. I remember him telling me that. And I said, well, yeah, it's my pleasure, man. And 
so we sat down and uh, he played uh, he played me these songs, you know, that I'd never heard before. But uh, he started playing me Sunday morning coming down, help me make it through the night. Me and Bobby McGee for the good times. I, I couldn't believe how good these songs were, you know, I mean, even at my dumb age, you know. He, and uh, he was such an inc- just an incredible, you know, writer. Man, this guy was just at the top of his game, no doubt. Well, it was back back then. He didn't have a pot to pee in, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so we went down the stairs, and Larry introduced us to the crowd, and we played, and uh, hardly anybody applauded, you know. And Chris was very, very uh, um, shy, you uh-huh, know, uh-huh. and and uh, and apologetic all the time, you know. And uh, so we did this for a while, just him and I, you know. And um, and then uh, then one week uh, when I was with Linda, about a year later. We were playing at the Troubadour, and our opening act was Chris Christopherson. And now a buzz started going around town about Chris because he had he had done a movie called Cisco Pike, and um, so and people were kind of kind of coming out to, to see him. The buzz was out, and he had a little trio uh, were backing him up uh, uh, as opening act. He had uh, Billy Swan on bass, who would later write the tune, have a big hit on "I Can Help" if you remember that song, yeah, uh-huh. uh, and. Uh, and on on the other guitar, acoustic guitar, Dennis Lindy uh, played, and and Dennis wrote "Burning Love" for 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 Elvis, you know. Mm-hmm. But they didn't they didn't have a, a drummer, and they really didn't have a lead player, you know. So since I was playing with Linda, head headlining, I told Chris, I said, "Hey, you want me to play guitar with you? I mean, I'm here, and, and she's paying me." And uh, he said, "Oh man, you know, I, I, you know, I can't pay him much." I said, "Forget about that, you know. I'd love, I'll, I'd love to do it." So for that week, I played behind both acts, and I played behind uh, Chris, and it was just the most incredible week, electric week at the Troubadour. The place was packed every night, and one night we were on stage, and Chris uh, said to me, "I got," he says, "I got right before the show." He said, "I got a friend coming up and singing uh, tonight, and, and uh, he's uh, he's going to do uh, he's just going to do one song, but can you guys back him up?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, sure, no problem, you know." So we get on stage and I'm wondering who the, who it is. And uh, Chris says, um, all right, I'd like to stop the show right now and bring a friend of mine up to do a song. And you all may know who he is. He says, ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Cash. Oh, well, no. John, Johnny Cash, out of nowhere, Johnny Cash pops on the stage. And the Troubadour stage was pretty crowded because we had a full drum set up there. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm freaking, you know, I'm totally losing it. There was Johnny Cash, you know, and, and he's huge, and he and he looks like he's a, like 50 feet tall, like Mount Rushmore. Anyway, he grabs a guitar, and we did, um, uh, 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 I think we did Folsom Prison Blues, written, and uh, the place went crazy. You know, you can imagine all these all these like hippies in the audience were like freaking, you know. And <laughs> and John's up John's up there singing, and he's whirling around, and we're, we're I hear the train coming, and it comes time for the solo, and uh, the guitar solo. Um, which is like this iconic solo that Luther Perkins played, his original guitar player who had died the year before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so anyway, I knew this solo. So the solo, guitar solo came, I started playing it, and Johnny came right, right up to my face and his nose like touched my nose. And he looks at me straight in the eye and he says, pick it, Luther. <laughs> You know, and my and I, I tell you what, my knees were knocking, but I played it and the place went crazy. And and uh, and Cash finished a tune and he and he got off the stage and it was like somebody sucked all the air out of the place, you know, when he when he left the stage. And it was the most incredible night. And I got to tell you, at the end of the night, it was closing night. And at the end of the night, uh, after the crowd had left and they were cleaning up the tables and stuff, uh, I was uh, in the stairwell of the Troubadour and. Uh, and this beautiful blonde girl comes up to me and gives me this big kiss, you know? And uh, I went, wow, man, how cool is that, you know? And there at the top of the, stair- the stairs uh, waiting for me is Chris. And he says, uh, he says, well, you've made it, Beeland. And I said, what do you mean I've made it? He says, you're a full-blown star now. You got a... Uh, um, you just got kissed by Faye Dunaway, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I was, you know, I was totally flipped out. You know, I I ran down the stairs to see if she was still there, but she was in some limo that he whisked away. You know, um, the, the 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 touching thing about that whole first week was, uh, uh, so I got all my crap packed and you know, leaving the troubadour, and uh, 
and Chris gets me to, to the side and he and he pulls out a couple of bills and he says, I got 35 bucks, man. He says, here, you take it, you know, for, for work with me this week. And I said, Chris, I don't want money. Linda's paying me. He says, no, no, no. He says, I want you to take this. He says, and when I, uh, when I became a, a, a household name, I'll, I'll hire you back for more. Mm-hmm. And we laugh, we laughed about it, you know, but a year, uh, a year and a half later, I was doing the Grand Old Opry with Chris, and he was paying me a lot more. And we were doing coliseums and big, uh, you know, the biggest venues you can imagine. And uh, and I was his guitar player in 1973. That is know? so cool, John. Yeah, that is a so, true story. So cool. Um, yeah, Elvis Presley. What? what? <laughs> yeah, I had been working with uh, Joe Gershio, his conductor. Right. Uh, who I, I met him through Johnny Tillotson, who I was uh, I was Johnny's musical director. And uh, anyway, I knew Joe in Vegas, and we hit it off real good. He was a real tough guy, Joe Garisho, a tough. You've probably seen him in the video conducting the horn sections. Well, actually, in '74, yeah. my band was playing in Lake Tahoe at the Sahara, and uh, oh. on the main on the main uh, uh, headlining was Elvis Presley, and and I remember seeing that name down below as the orchestra leader. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was Joe was a musical was the kind of like musical director in, in uh-huh. a way, and. Uh, and so we hit it off really good. I had I had I had an impressive. Uh, by the time I first met Joe, I had my own pretty impressive career uh, credits. And so, for some reason, we hit it off really good. He was a big Italian macho man guy, colorful, wore the big Elvis belt around him, mm-hmm. you know, dark hair and a goatee, and very intimidating to a lot of players. But to me, he treated me great. And uh, we started uh, working together in the studio, working with doing a couple sides. Well, we were in Las Vegas with Johnny Tillotson, and uh, and then uh, we uh, we wrote a commercial together for the Hilton Hotel, which uh, um, made me a small fortune, you know. And uh, um, and so I got to know Joe real good. And uh, one day, uh, one day, uh, right around Christmas time, uh, I was in Hollywood. And my wife and I were getting ready to go Christmas shopping, and I got a call from Joe, and he said. Uh, um, Hey, listen, man, uh, I've been trying to get a hold of you all day long. Don't you ever answer your phone? And I kept thinking, well, that's pretty rude, you know. <laughs> and I said, what do you think I'm doing, sitting around the house waiting for you to call me all day, you know? <laughs> he says, don't you He says, don't you want to work? And I said, well, what kind of stupid question is that, Joe? And he says, and he laughed. He says, listen, how'd you like to work with Elvis? And I said, what do you think? Are you kidding me? And he says, no, James is uh, leaving. He's going with Emmylou Harris, and uh, and he turned at his notice. And uh, uh, do you want the gig? It pays uh, 1200 a week. I said, I, I, yeah, I want it. And so uh, he said, okay, we'll be sending you out some albums and stuff to, to, to learn, and uh, uh, and I'll, I'll be getting in touch with you, you know. And I'm, I'm freaking, you know. I'm jumping up and down. I called my parents up. I called everybody I knew. And... Uh, and then about a week later, uh, I got a call from Joe, and he said, "I got some bad news for you. Uh, um, Elvis offered uh, Burton a few more bucks to stay with him, and Burton took it. Oh, and man. and uh, and so uh, I, I I lost the gig, and then Emmy Lou was up the creek because she lost Burton, you know. Yeah. So that's when that's when Emmy Lou got uh, Albert Lee to replace Burton." And, uh, and then, uh, um, Burton went with Elvis, but it was okay for me because I, uh, I went with, uh, Kim Carnes and I was on tour with her. So, but, uh, I came, I, 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 I got to meet Elvis and, uh, um, I knew all of the songs. My style of guitar playing was very similar to James, which is why I got the, the gig with not only with Elvis, but with Ricky Nelson, because, uh, James and I were, were very similar as players, and and we had uh, worked together on on uh, a number of sessions. So, uh, I was yeah, I was disappointed that the Elvis gig uh, fell through. But uh, looking back on it, you know, uh, and seeing all the trouble that he had, uh, uh, maybe it was it was uh, good that I didn't take it uh, um, because I had uh, a lot of fun uh, recording and touring with uh, Kim Carnes, you know, and. Uh, yeah. So yeah, brush with greatness, you know. You bet. Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about your involvement with Apple Records over in London, and, and what sure. year did that happen, and, and how long did well, that? Happen? Well, in seventy in seventy two, Johnny and I uh, flew to uh, uh, to uh, Europe to tour, and uh, we had we had a European. We had, we had a band from uh, 
Birmingham, a rhythm section, and then I played lead. And uh, we toured with Del Shannon and Bobby V all over um, Europe. And uh, and while we were, we were in London, uh, I, I in the meantime, I, back in L.A., I had recorded a tune that I had written. And uh, I had the rhythm track and, and my scratch vocal, and I had the tape. By chance, I had the cassette tape with me. And uh, Johnny said, listen, I got, he said, my old publicity guy from the, from the, er, my, the early days, Tony King, is now the uh, head of A&R at Apple, since we're in England. Why don't you let me call Tony and see if we can set up a meeting and he can hear the tape and see if they're, you know, if they'd be interested. And I went, oh, man, yeah. Are you kidding? You know, he said, no. So Johnny made the call and Tony uh, said, yeah, I'll meet with John in the morning and tell him to come down. You know, holy shit, you know. I said, I, I went down to London and went up to Apple and I, I was I was shaking, man, you know, because you, you can't get higher than this. This is this is it, you know. And uh, I walk in the, the, the door and uh, there's a doorman there, you know, and like a like the Queen's Castle. And you walk inside and the walls are just smothered in gold records, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, thin walls. It was the same building where the Beatles did uh, their last concert on the roof, you know. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, so anyway, I get into the elevator and it goes up to the uh, top floor in Tony's office. And he's a very, very nice guy who, by the way, is on Facebook and he's, he's still a friend of mine to this day. Um, Tony uh, says, hey, John, you know, come get a, tell me about yourself and blah, blah, and and, and he says, do you, have a, do you have a tape? And I said, yeah, I have this cassette of what I'm working on back in L.A. And he put it on and he loved it, you know. And uh, he said, man, he said, listen, the guys are all out of the country, but Ringo's coming back tonight. And um, let me play it for him, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me or what? You know, this is, <laughs> this is I, I kept thinking that any minute he was going to say, Oh, Beeland. We thought it was Boyland. I'm sorry, there was been, there's been a mix-up. You're gonna have you're gonna have to leave right now. You know? uh, so anyway, he plays it and he says, "I'll, I'll play for Ringo." Okay. So anyway, I, once I le you know I left and I went back to uh, Birmingham where Johnny and I were staying, and uh, uh, I told Johnny what happened, and I I thought that I'd never hear from them again, you know, and uh, I get a I get a phone call the next day early in the morning, and it's Tony. And he says, hi, John. Uh, he says, uh, listen, are you sitting down? I, I said, yeah. He says, I played it for Ringo what he, last night, and he loved it. And uh, how'd you like to join the Apple family? And oh, I kept thinking, wow. uh, I kept thinking, what's he talking about? And I, that, then it dawned on me, and I started shaking, you know. And I went, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, he says um, can you have your manager f fly out, and we'll wrap this whole thing up this week? And uh um, and I went, yeah, sure. So, uh, I called my manager up in New York and my manager had just uh, verbally okayed a record deal for me for Scepter records. And, uh, and I, and I called and I called my manager and I told him, I said, nix the deal with Scepter and get out here. The Beatles want to sign me. And he was all flustered about it and upset because he wanted, he had this deal locked up, you know? But he agreed, and he came out, and, and uh, you know who that manager was? Mm -mm. Morton Downey Jr. Oh no, <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, yeah, he was the guy that the, I had met him in Washington with Johnny. He was Johnny's best friend, and he put up the money for that little demo tape that I made. Wow! And uh, and anyway, uh, Downey comes out to flies over to London, and but and so Downey and Tillotson and I. Uh, um, it went up to Apple and, uh, we signed the deal. Um, I never got to, to meet Ringo, but, uh, we saw, but he approved, he approved the deal and, uh, we signed it and it was a great deal for me. Uh, I got to produce myself and, and it was, it was an artist's dream. The deal was, and, uh, later that night when we were playing in Birmingham, uh, Johnny stopped the show and told the crowd that I had, the Beatles had just signed me to Apple and, uh, Del, I'll never forget it. Del Shannon and Bobby V came out from the wings with a bucket of beer, and uh, they all did a big toast to me, and everybody was uh, uh, saluting me for being signing to Apple Records, and uh, and it was great. And so I came home to to America, and uh, back to Hollywood, and started finishing the album. You know, and uh, I got like two thirds through it, and. Um, 
got a telegram from Tony King saying that the Beatles were, uh, everything was tied up in litigation with Alan Klein and, uh, and that all contracts were on hold indefinitely. And uh, he's, he gave me two options. One, I could, I could wait it out with the Beatles or I could take what I've got right now and, and get another deal, look for another deal. And so luckily, Downey was able to go back to Scepter Records and, and uh, salvage the, the original deal that he had put together. And the album came out on Scepter. Oh, wow. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, that was my, uh, my deal with, uh, uh, with Apple. And, and, you know, I was the last artist uh, signed to Apple. Um, I, I was hanging out a couple of years ago with James Taylor up in Wisconsin. He was, I knew, I knew James and I had worked with his sister, Kate and, uh, we were backstage and in, in one of his concerts. And, uh, I told, uh, we were laughing because he was the first artist signed and I was the last. And I said, and he said, uh, between us, we totally, uh, we drove that label into the ground. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. One of the yeah. songs that you sent me that, that I, I was uh, very impressed with, uh, called Slow Walk. Oh, yeah, uh, right. Yeah, that was just recorded by uh, Bonnie Tyler. She's on her new album, and uh, which I was really surprised, you know, but she did a great job on it. And, and she's, you know, I really like Bonnie Tyler. She's a great, uh, great artist. And uh, yeah, it's out now. It's on her new album. Well, some people do it when they're feeling blue And some people do it when they've got nothing to do Lovers like to do it on a midnight stroll And a gambling man will do it when he loses that roll He'll do the slow walk They do the slow walk You don't do a lot of thinking, you don't talk a lot of talk You just shuffle those feet and you do the slow walk Well, a man will learn to do it if he stayed out all night And he knows he's headed home to a knockdown, drag out fight A prisoner learns to do it when he loses that appeal and he knows when he's through chewing up that last meal He'll do the slow walk They do the slow walk You don't do a lot of thinking You don't talk a lot of talk You just shuffle those feet And you do the slow walk Is that a song that you had written a while back Or did you specifically write that for her? No, I wrote it a while back with, along with my friend Brian Cadd, who's a big uh, singer-songwriter legend in Australia, and he, he and I are best friends, and uh, we, we just wrote it uh, for ourselves, and uh, for some reason, the demo, uh, I did a demo of it. Well, I, I sent it to you. You're gonna, you've got the demo of it in your own hand right. that, I, that I did. It got to Bonnie, and she liked it, and, and uh, lo and behold, it's, it's out right now. Nice. I want you to talk a little bit about your title song off of, of your solo album uh, by the same name, Bare Bones. Oh, yeah, Bare Bones. Uh huh. Well, um, when I moved back to California in 1999, I had burned out on Nashville. And uh, so I uh, moved to the Napa Valley where my sister lived and my parents are buried. And, uh, and, I, and I just love Napa and uh, and so um, I put my studio, my recording studio together. I lived in Yobbville, actually, right next door out in the vineyards. And uh, and I wanted to do an album, but I didn't want to do anything real fancy schmancy. You know, I, I, I thought I would uh, just do like kind of an acoustic album, you know, and, uh, and featuring uh, all new songs that I had written. And uh, and the first song was Bare Bones, and um, and I thought, well, that kind of sums it up because the album is just acoustic guitar and the, and an upright bass. A lonesome cry from a hungry dog sends an old fox running to a hollow log. 
There's a kid in the schoolyard, gun in his hand Got the eyes of a child, the anger of a man Bare bones, trying to get by Hand to mouth, just to survive Bare bones, struggling times It's a chilly world when the sun won't shine Neath the halo of an old street light In the morning hours of a lonely night She prays that soon her prince will come Before she sees that morning sun Bare bones trying to get by Hand to mouth just to survive Bare bones struggling time it's a chilly world when the sun won't shine. Oh, yeah. This question is one that I normally ask at the beginning, but sure. but because you had so many A players, when you're writing, who where do you get your inspiration? You know, what is, what's your biggest moment of inspiration that that helps you create your your songs? It, you know, I yeah, I get mine from a title. You know, I mean, if I hear something, there's something in me that clicks and says, well, that's a great title for a tune. And, and then I go from there, you know. Uh, and so that's kind of where I work from. I get a title and then I build on it. And uh, uh, and also I've got this I've got this gift, you know, because that's what it is uh, to be able to put hooks together and and uh, and neat chord changes instantly, you know, and uh, which is why I've been able to co-write with a lot of famous writers because uh i'm pretty good in that department when uh, i'm writing with a lyricist you know i can get inspired sure. by their lyrics to, yeah. to add and, and, tra- and it translates immediately to the guitar you know and uh so yeah so that's that's how i get it i i only a few times have i sat down to specifically write for one a certain project you know um it, it becomes it becomes a, a real um uh skill uh, to be able to to write professionally and actually be making a living off of it, and because I've worked with so many people and co-written with so many great people, I I learned the skills that are really required for 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 serious commercial uh, songwriting, and uh, and and I applied them to my own writing when I'd write on my own. I I would think like, well, how would uh, my buddy Dwayne Blackwell? How would he? How would he? Uh, approach this and da, 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 da. and uh, so it really helped working with all of those great people because uh, with everybody I work with I there was always something I could take away with take away something with you know you bet. and uh, and uh, in the, yeah and so I've been very very fortunate to be able to work with some of the greatest you know acts and be able to uh, study them and learn from them and, and and just about every act that I've worked with has always treated me exceptional too. I've, uh, I, I've had such a great time over the almost 60 years, you know, of, uh, uh, I think about 54 years. And I started out as a little kid in Hollywood, you know, I mean, I, I was a runaway. I was 16 and I had the police were looking for me and, uh, you know, and I started from living on the street in Hollywood to playing, you know, Carnegie hall with Arlo. And, and it's, it, it's a humbling to, to look back on that, you know, and to, to be able to, uh, to say, you know, that, uh, uh, that actually happened to me, you know, cause when I was a kid in Chicago, you know, back in my town, which was called hometown, Illinois, I, I never, you know, I used to dream about it, but I never had the, the faintest notion on, on, uh, going to California or let alone end up spending my entire life in the music business. Sure. I mean, what a trip, you know, I mean, one minute I'm sitting in the living room, laying down, watching TV, watching Ricky Nelson sing, uh, uh, hello, Mary Lou. And then years later, there I am on Saturday night live with Ricky Nelson playing hello, Mary Lou. And so all of that is incredible stuff that I'm so thankful for, you know, and, uh, um, it's been, it's been a, a wonderful ride for me. And, um, if I had to do it all over again, I would do it exactly the same. 
Well, tell me about the the new book coming out, and when do you expect it to land? Well, both books can be will be found. You can find Best Seat at Amazon dot com. Okay. And Best Best Seat in the House, and that tells a lot of the stories that we've been talking about now. There's that and a lot more in that book, and that covers my career all the way up to eighty five. And uh, the new book is um, doesn't really follow anything chronolo- chronologically, it, but uh, it talks about different moments of working with uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, famous artists and uh, what the second half of my career was like. And um, I, I think, uh, I think you'll, you'll like it. It, it, it. It's really a kind of an interesting book to, because I, I, it's not a tech book or it's not a book that, that delves into all of these, you know, details that are uninteresting to the average, you know, music fan. Uh, we get right, right to the point, to the heart of the stories, you know, and, and uh, rather than, go on and on and on about stuff that maybe like, you know, four fat kids would, would, would like, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's written in a way that, it, that everybody I think could relate to it. So, and the, and the second book will be called, uh, pass the guitar and I'll tell you a story great. by John Beeland. Great, man. Great. John, this has been a real treat talking with you today. I really, uh, thanks Rick. Well, I really appreciate you, uh, including me, uh, uh, you know, in, in the show. And, uh, I think it's a, it's a, the, the premise is really cool. And, you know, I never get tired of hearing stories from, from, uh, musicians either, you know, so, uh, I, I hope, uh, people enjoyed it. Well, I'm sure they will. It's been a real pleasure visiting with you. Uh, uh, we've just met, and I consider you uh, a, a great friend now. I, I want to keep the relationship going. I want to keep track of what what you're doing, and I definitely am going to get your books and uh, you know learn. Well, thank you, Rick. I will right back at you, buddy, and and uh, uh, hope that we get to hook up in person uh, sooner than, sooner than later. Sounds great. Maybe someday we can gig uh, get uh, Johnny Cochran and you and me, and we'll get a couple other guys, and we'll go jam it out somewhere, man. You count me in. <laughs> <laughs> Good talking to you, buddy. Stay safe. Good talking and to you, Rick. We'll talk to you soon, okay? Adios. Take care, my friend. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, and let us know what you think. To catch all the latest from me, please go to Talk and Rock Radio, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.